Hey, Nephew community. My name is Tazine Ajaz, and today we're doing a podcast discussing the future of healthcare beyond 2020. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Josh Lipschutz, who is the Renal Division Chief at Medical University of South Carolina, and Dr. Shayan Shirazian, who is the Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology at Columbia University Medical Center. Welcome, and thanks for joining me today. So today we're just gonna be discussing really how has life changed in the last six months? You know, COVID-19 has really posed some challenges on nephrology practice. So Dr. Lipschutz, you know, how has your practice changed over the last six months? Yeah, so one thing, you know, we've done, and I think most places have done, we're doing a lot of telemedicine. They say telemedicine advanced 10 years in the last couple of uh, months. Um, just to keep everybody safe. So I, I think that that'll be a big change going forward. They'll still, it'll still, you know, there's there's some, still something special about the face to face, and you can still do a much better exam, of course. And but I think there'll be a, a role for a much bigger role for telemedicine. So I think that's one big change. And then COVID, we're we're still wondering about how it's going to affect the kidney long term. It, uh, we may see. We were actually I was talking to one of the fellows earlier today. That there may be a wave of um, chronic kidney disease after mm-hmm. the um, the COVID uh, epidemic, even after it's the pandemic, after it's over, after we have a vaccine, there may be residual um, lots of CKD. So we'll have to see. Yeah, you know, we've really definitely heard that telemedicine has fi- finally found its home within this pandemic. Dr. Shrazin, do you have some of the same um, experience with using telemedicine? Have you been using it a lot? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my my practice has changed dramatically in the past six months, mm-hmm. uh, as Dr. Lipschitz is saying. So at the beginning, I mean, we were obviously inundated in March and April with a lot of COVID at Columbia and New York City. We were in we were inpatient mostly in the hospital doing CRT, doing hemodialysis, doing acute consults. And there wasn't much outpatient and, and actually not much telemedicine to start. But then, you know, as things calmed down a little bit heading into May, uh, we did transition to a lot of telemedicine. And at first there were a lot of um, technical difficulties, hiccups, lost calls. Um, but there's really been a really fast learning curve in terms of physicians and, and patients picking up the technology. So I would say, you know, I, I have three clinic days a week, and right now two of those three days are, are still telemedicine, and, wow. it's, and it's going increasingly better, I would say. Um, I also do, uh, as, as I was saying earlier, I do some home dialysis, mm-hmm. and that does lend itself to telemedicine. So in general, they come they come twice a month. Uh, to the dialysis center if you're a home dialysis patient, one to get labs and meet with the team and the other to meet with a physician. So the physician, the second meeting has also been through telemedicine. Um, So I I am able to see dialysis patients through telemedicine. The in-center hemo is is much tougher. And so I I still go in to see uh, my in-center hemo patients as an outpatient. Um, But yeah, a lot of telemedicine, um, as Dr. Lipschutz is saying, you know, there might be a new wave, new wave of, of CKD and ESRD patients yeah. related to COVID. There's also the old wave that, you know, has a high mortality and we fear that they may have been lost, you know, a good percentage may have been lost to COVID. So, um, so you know, specifically with this new wave coming, you know, it makes sense given the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and how it's impacting the kidneys with ACE2 and that mechanism, you know, it, are you guys doing anything to actually ramp up testing for this new wave of patients? Because I have heard from some NKF chapters that they are actually getting ready for this. Is that something you guys are doing in your institutions? I, th- I think it's still debated exactly, you know, what's going on in the kidney. Um, so you're right, there are, the ACE2 receptor is in the kidney but then there's a question of whether it's really the virus is directly in the mm-hmm. kidney or whether it's a secondary damage of the cytokine storm um, and it's you know more of a standard ATN. So I guess I guess we'll have to see you know as time goes on what's exactly going on. We, we haven't um, done anything specific, although we're we're definitely ready. I did have one. I, I have this. I don't know if you can see this. But this is uh, uh, maybe. 
Well, it, it's a sign that says, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. So this is, you know, with, you were talking about the, uh, thing, <laughs> the Zoom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, so my, That's I, a good I, sign. I'm going to steal that. Uh, That's hilarious. <laughs> That's a great idea because I think there's sign. a meme that's like, I mean, everybody, the most annoying thing of 2020 is that phrase. Yeah, yeah I do this. <laughs> yeah, I can't hear you. <laughs> like charades or something. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when it, I know we've been talking about telemedicine and, you know, a lot of people think that even past this COVID-19, like once the vaccine is actually here, you know, a lot of people will still continue to see their pa their patients through this virtual means. You know, how do you think you guys will be seeing your patients um, in the future, you know, past COVID-19? Do you think it's still going to be a lot of telemedicine or a combination or in person? What's your feeling, Dr. Shirazian? I hope there is. So, I think, you know, Dr. Lipschitz was, he was talking about this a little bit earlier. I think something is lost in the patient interaction aspect. I mean, as nephrologists, I, this is kind of heresy to say, but we don't, the physical exam helps, but I, I don't think it's uh, as important as some of the objective findings that we have, like, you know, creatinine trend, electrolytes, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but beyond the not having the physical, I think there is some face-to-face -face interaction, you know, some, some empathy, something is, is, is lost in terms of uh, telemedicine and interacting with the patients. That being said, I think there are definitely opportunities and I wish that it does, con you know, continue after this whole era is over. I think there's an opportunity to, to have um, more streamlined processes you know, you, you can add potentially more patients to your panel. I do, I do, I see stone patients. A lot of times telemedicine does lend itself to that. And if it continues to grow, I'm hoping there are opportunities to do multidisciplinary kind of meetings through telemedicine, maybe mm -hmm. like a Zoom platform. Uh, I haven't done that yet. And, and I know there, there are considerations in terms of everyone's time and, and being, um, you know, reimbursed for that time. So it, there's some de there's some details to be worked out. But in terms of streamlining how you see patients, opportunity for for multidisciplinary meetings, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of potential there, and I, and I hope it does continue. Yeah, I think some will depend on how it's reimbursed, whether the reimbursement will continue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping it will. Um, maybe there could be a kind of a hybrid system where we could see every other time in person and then in between by tele telemedicine maybe. But um, so, so some some of it will depend on how how you know how the how the money comes. <laughs> you know, it's not the best way to do medicine, but that's how. Yeah. I know, unfortunately. <laughs> but so are you guys actually looking at, you know, with in regards to telemedicine, are you looking at patient sat satisfaction or provider satisfaction while using telemedicine? Because, you know, Dr. Shirazian, you did say this empathy factor, that that's something that you're losing. And I can imagine that there's certain conversations specific to CKD patients that you'd want to have in person, like, you know, thinking about going on dialysis or, you know, conversations that really, you know, patients need a lot of support from that healthcare provider. So have you, are there any institutions at least that you know of that are actually surveying patients to see how satisfied they are with telemedicine? I'm sure it's being done. I, I don't know of it. I haven't done it personally. I think it's really, it is important. Like you're saying, it's, it's something really important to look at, but I, I haven't, I don't know anyone in my division that is, is doing that right now, but, it, but it's, it's a great idea, you know, something that I'm sure is being done, but I, I just don't know. And I think it's a great idea. It, and it'll be interesting, you know, what nephrology versus other practices. I think something like dermatology would be really hard to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to, yeah, make sense. But, but, but others might be better. And um, yeah, that, that I'm, I'm, I hope someone's doing that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, are you guys satisfied with telemedicine? Um, provider satisfaction. Yeah, I always joke that by the time the pandemic's over, we may get these Doxy or Zoom conferences down pat. 
there's there's yeah. always something that seems to go wrong and and a lot of patients um don't don't have they still have flip phones or they don't have computers the older yeah. ones and um so it's yeah, i'm resorting to to phone calls mm -hmm. um and so then you can't even really see the patient and it takes another dimension away yeah uh, yeah i didn't even know flip phones existed so yeah <laughs> that they still exist yeah <laughs> yeah. I, yeah i yeah i agree i mean i i think like i said before there's a lot of opportunity um but and i think there's an opportunity for it to be faster but the processes have not been streamlined enough yet i mean the time is lost in different areas now you know it's in it's, it's actually connecting with the person takes five to ten minutes sometimes um of getting them to do the right thing or trying something else um so that can be frustrating and i, and I do get frustrated with that aspect if, if they're spanish speaking because we have a big spanish speaking population i feel like it's definitely suboptimal to have mm -hmm. you know an intercom on top of an intercom is is really not the best way um yeah. to practice medicine uh and i i'm sure there are ways around that that will be developed but right now it's not it's not optimal i mean i do i do really i think i think it could be streamlined in a way and like i said i think there are definitely situations not the advanced ckd patient that needs to be going on dialysis soon i think that that is someone you should probably see in person you know mm -hmm. there, there are subtle uremic findings as well you might miss i mean but there are definitely, you know, early CKD3 or someone who's stable or the stone patient, like I was talking about. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that that's something that hopefully will continue to have a place with telemedicine. Yeah. yeah. There is something about laying on the hands and listening to their heart, and, and it makes more of a patient doctor relationship. And mm -hmm. we have things like um, Dr. Shirazian was saying, you know, the, the later, CKD5, we want to make sure they don't have a uremic pericarditis. We, mm -hmm. you know, we listen to their heart and pick up the subtle signs of uremia. So it, it can't replace it totally, but I think it, it does have a place. Stones would be a great one, or early CKD would be good too. Yeah. So, I mean, it, obviously there's a lot of pros and cons with telemedicine, um, but, you know, COVID-19 has... I think it's made a lot of people kind of think about healthcare in general, right? Like it's exposed a lot of cracks in our system. What do you guys think is gonna be the main driver for our future in healthcare, Dr. Lipschutz? Well, I think there there's a lot of inequities. We know that COVID's kind of exposed that people who are getting it are the minorities who have to be out there working, who have a lot of comorbidities you know, African Americans have a lot higher incidence of hypertension, um, kidney disease, maybe uh, threefold over, and a lot of it's due probably to a gene mutation in ApoL1, which in West Africans um, protected against sleeping sickness, but predisposes to uh, unfortunately kidney disease. So I think there's already a lot of, and especially in nephrology, there's a lot of inequities and something like like COVID comes along and it, you know, it even adds to that and doubles it. And, you know, it, it's harder, you know, you can't stay home, you can't isolate, you have to go to work, you have to do this. Yeah, so I, I hope that, that that comes out a lot more and that, and I think, you know, maybe that people who don't even have health insurance and things like that. So, so I hope this kind of shines a light on a lot of the problems that were there um, and it got amplified with the COVID. Yeah. Dr. Shirazian? What about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, about the future of healthcare after the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, I, you know, I think I think the point about inequities is a great one, and um, you know, that's something that's being brought to the forefront right now. And you know, hopefully, it's something that we can continue to you know to to work at and address. And we, I like Dr. Lipschitz is saying. I mean, we see that every day in nephrology. I um. I think that potentially telemedicine has has the potential to worsen inequity. I mean, obviously, you know, there there's going to be a group of patients that that are probably in the same cohort that is already you know disadvantaged that are going to not have telemedicine technology. So that's something we really have to be aware of as well. Um, 
But I think the future, besides addressing the inequity, I think it's gonna be, you know, some application of, of telemedicine, making things easier for patients, um, you know, having multidisciplinary meetings through telemedicine, using telemedicine when appropriate. Um, I think that is going to be the future. And so we should, I mean, this year has really been a paradigm shifting year in terms of adopting telemedicine and in terms of approaching inequity. So I think hopefully that's where the future is, is that we try to um, really, uh, really strengthen these processes and, and streamline things and make them better for the future. So when you when you talk about this multidisciplinary approach to and using telemedicine, what are you kind of envisioning? Like with nephrology, what other disciplines uh, would be involved in that approach? Is it just any? Is it you know, I just thought about this today. Actually, <laughs> it, I don't know anyone who's doing this, and uh, their economic considerations. You know, because you know, if your physician is going to sit on a multidisciplinary call that takes a long time, you know, it's going to be, it's got to be time that is ultimately is um, uh, compensated for, which is a difficult question. But like, say, for example, the stone clinic, um, you know, if I'm on with the urologist and I'm on the, with the nutritionist, or if we're on back to back, you know, mm -hmm. back to back to back, that's very streamlined for the patient and they get everything in, in one setting. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't have to go anywhere to three separate appointments. Right. And um, you know, and it probably is better care, you know, if, if we get the notes directly in real time and, and then we talk about it. And so that's one application, you know, there's, there's multidisciplinary meetings in, in kidney transplant, um, usually happening before the transplant. But if the same thing is applied to advanced CKD, where you have a social worker, nutritionist, uh -huh. uh, physician, yeah. you know, MSL works in there too. I mean, if not to talk to the patient, but if you know, yeah. at the end of this multidisciplinary meeting, you guys all decide, hey, we need this medication. We don't know about the insurance. How do we, you know, how can we get this resolved? It, it, it also streamlines, you know, if we have a direct access to an MSL, it streams, it streamlines, streamlines the problem. Mm -hmm. so, oh. so. It, I mean, it definitely sounds like a, a cool approach and um, yeah, I don't know, like, <laughs> practically, I don't know, I mean, how that would work. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while and practically it hasn't worked out. So I, it's no. just a, you know. It's because actually another physician mentioned to me about um, psychiatrists and how, you know, sure. patients with CKD have higher levels of depression, anxiety, and he doesn't feel like a lot of these patients actually go to seek mental health. And so he feels like telemedicine would actually be really great in dialysis centers where they could actually just use telemedicine for psych, right, mental health. So I think this kind of also fits into that where you can really utilize it in a great way for nephrology care. For psychiatry especially, I think that would be good. I mean, we've had long waits to try and get some of my patients that I've seen, you know, because it's life-changing when you go on dialysis and yeah. you don't feel well and, and depression is not uncommon. And I've had patients crying and, and I try and get them in and it's a month or it's a month wait, it's two months wait to see. Whereas maybe with telemedicine, which probably would lend itself to to psychiatry. I think um, a lot of it's talking, so it might be able to be especially helpful there. Mm -hmm. How do you guys think you know a company or a platform like ours could fit into that? Because we are kind of in a unique position where we are nephrology and a mental health company, and we're kind of trying to see you know how can we kind of combine those two divisions and help because what we're noticing more and more is that there is this huge psychological burden that the nephrology community has and a lot of times it's just those patients don't have the time to seek help or there's there's not that collaboration between that mental health provider and the nephrology practice um, so is there something that like some, a company like Otska that has assets in both and, you know, medical teams on both sides, is there something you could think of that we could do to collaborate and help on some of these initiatives? Because it's, you know, with 
thinking of this virtual world now, you know, with telemedicine and uh, apps that are coming out, I think it could be cool. Yeah, cool I mean, I think to, to Dr. Lipschitz's point, if you could g give us a name of a healthcare provider that's accepting patients and mm -hmm. that will see our patients in a timely fashion and accept their insurance, um, like a resource, a resources in that way. I, that's a, it sounds very simple, but it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think time is important because when people are upset, you know, you don't have that. You don't want to say, well, we'll see you in a month or two. And then, yeah, so that's the limiting factor is the time, the wait time, it seems like. And I think, I, I don't know the data, but at least in Charleston, finding psychiatrists or psychologists to talk to patients, the wait is huge. Mm -hmm. And I guess with COVID, probably there's a lot more mental health issues right now. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the same yeah. here. It's it's It's... It's, it's literally impossible. I mean, we say that depression, is, you know, up to 30% of our dialysis patients are depressed, yet, you know, these patients are not, they're, they're not being seen by any healthcare providers. I can yeah. The mental health care providers. And I think one, one good thing is CMS is focusing on nephrology and actually has some innovative ideas, the Kidney Care First program and others, where they're going to try and they're actually doing a randomized study where they're going to be, you know, we had applied to be in the kidney care first program. We were accepted. I'm not sure we're actually, I don't know if we have the big enough base to do it, but they're focused. And one of the focuses, the quality care initiatives was on depression for CMS. Oh, cool. mm -hmm. so that might be one thing. So what do you guys think is the biggest opportunity in kidney health care? in general or yeah in general like or like going towards the future what where does the opportunity lie in kidney health care i think the, another initiative through the cms the through the government is this focus on transplant they want lots more tra and tra transplant is definitely the way to go because i always tell my patients dialysis replaces about 15 percent of your kidney function so mm -hmm. people feel oh i mean it keeps them alive so it's great but um, they don't really feel well. Very few people work who are on dialysis. Or whether you, when you get a new kidney, it's 50% of your kidney function, and people feel much better. They live much longer. They're healthier. I mean, it's not just a few years; it's really decades. Mm -hmm. um, our, our dialysis population is, is is dying at about 20% a year. That's that's almost as bad as many cancers. Wow. So five-year survival is, you know, partly you know the comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension. So I think the a focus on on um, transplant and maybe home health care, uh, home dialysis modalities, PD, the is CMS is also focusing on. So I think those are very actually very good things that the government's focusing on. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shirazin, would you agree with that? Yeah, I was going to say, um, took my answer. I was going to say uh, home dialysis and obviously transplant. Um, there's been a real push uh, from the government in terms of reimbursing that now as well, which is great. I, I mean, I think the, the idea is that we want to improve the quality of life in this population. You know, it's among the worst. Dialysis patients have, you know, among the worst quality of life of any chronic illness, including cancer, mm -hmm. loss of limb, you know, everything. So part of that is moving modalities home where they're more comfortable. I mean, the quality of life benefits have been have been proven for PD and HHD. Um, not not harder outcomes, but quality of life. And so, I think short of transplant, which is obviously everyone's goal, I think a push, you know, towards towards home dialysis is, is going to be the future. And and even going beyond that, for your CKD patients, you know, uh, we're focused. We're we're very focused on on quality of life metrics now as new metrics for studies. And I think beyond hard outcomes, that's that's something where the future lies is, is improving our patient's quality of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting, um, transplant after 2.5 years, it's actually cheaper than keeping someone on dialysis. Be, there's the upfront cost of surgery, but after that it becomes cheaper. So not only is it cheaper, but it's much better for the patient. They live much longer, feel much better. So I think, that was, a, I think, the target the government had in five years is 80% doing either transplant or home modalities. I don't know if that's um, possible, but I think it's certainly a good target, a, yeah. a, good, a good goal. It's 
So I know we we talked about, you know, these opportunities and we also talked about, you know, the concern of some of these COVID patients um, becoming potentially CKD patients and then even losing some of the CKD patients to COVID. Do you guys have any other concerns for the future of kidney health care? I mean, I, I wish we didn't have to see so many patients, but I, I think the, the trend is going up. You know, part of it's diabetes. You know, mm -hmm. we have there's an epidemic of also of diabetes. We see it type two diabetes in kids now. Diets are so bad, and now with people stuck at home, it's even worse. So in diabetes is probably forty percent of our dialysis patients come from diabetes with hypertension um, ads. So, so uh, I think unfortunately it's a, it's a population that's on a steady increase. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. there's there's going to be a need for more nephrologists. Which isn't happening though, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's a concern. Absolutely a concern mm -hmm. in terms of the future is, is recruiting good good physicians into nephrology. Um, there are many reasons for that, but that's concerning because the population is going to grow from here, the, the CKD and the SRT population. Yeah. I've heard that from everywhere across the board that they're just having such a hard time filling their fellowship. It's very concerning. Yeah, I mean, we've thankfully filled our fellowship um, every year, but nationally it is, it's like there's 0.6 applicants yeah. per spot. Um, part of it may be reimbursement, but part part of it, nephrology is hard. <laughs> yeah. Exceptionally, you know, people don't own, it's difficult to understand the fluid and electrolytes, but it's also it hard, is. you know, work with some yeah. of these patients who have, you know, these chronic diseases. And, um, I mean, I love it, but I, I can see where. No, it's, renal is hard. It was my hardest therapeutic class in school. <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody's, don't worry. They, they yeah. call it the kidney, the black box. So a lot yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a difficult one. So, but you know, once you understand it, I feel like it's very fascinating and interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. You, you it You'll takes never time. be bored. Uh, yeah, it does so many things. That, you know, the yep. kidney. Some some people, it's not think of it just as a waste disposal, but no, it, you know, it's it's making the red blood cells. It's controlling all our electrolytes, hypertension, exactly. stones, immunology. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, so. I always joke sometimes. All other organs exist to perfuse the kidney is what we would say. Someone actually told me that, you know, nephrologists became nephrologists because of the elegance of the kidneys. Like they fell in love with the physiology of it. And I just, I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, obviously with our platform, you know, thank you guys so much for coming on here and discussing these questions. Um, I have more, but I just wanted to let you know, you know, with the nephew, we really try to educate the community on so many different topics. I know Dr. Lipschutz, we did the COVID-19 and the kidneys topic, but on so many things, electrolyte disorders, hypertension, uh, anemia, PKD. How do you think nephew can help during this time of uncertainty, like during a pandemic like this? I think that the more information they, that that you can get out there, good information, because mm -hmm. a lot of things on the internet are not so not so good. But the more um, good information that you can get out to people, the better off everybody is. Yeah, Dr. Shirazian. Yeah, you know when when I look at the nephew site, I recently there's been a lot of good content surrounding COVID and mental health and you know you can get other providers experiences with that which is which is a great thing so it's just just timely topics that involve other physicians uh and kind of like a forum that's that's something that's valuable and we really appreciate you know all the time that everyone physicians like yourself really provide yeah and, and i would say good good bias-free information because yeah. you know that we we don't want things that are biased and we don't want, you know, we we want top quality information. So. Yeah. Well, we try. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Lipschutz and Dr. Shirazian for joining us today on today's podcast um, of discussing healthcare beyond 2020. And thank you again, nephew community, for joining us today. This is Tazine. Bye-bye. <laughs>